order. It's the underrated convenience of the Western world that one can turn on a tap and receive clean, pure water at an adequate pressure. Drinking, cleaning, washing, cooking. Water use is a critical part of our daily life and comes delivered through an expansive distribution system. Throughout much of human history, however, this convenience has not always been available. It took a large number of incremental advances in science and technology to engineer water distribution systems to be as reliable and inexpensive as they are today. I've always been interested in water distribution systems. Coming from a farm in the southwest of Australia, our family had to collect and store our own water for personal use as well as irrigation. This short presentation aims to provide a brief engineering history of water distribution systems, an overview of the current circumstances of distribution systems and the directions for the future, whilst providing this in a West Australian context. One of the first engineering problems humans faced was the supply of water for domestic use and the irrigation of crops. Urban lifestyles can only be retained with abundant water, as is clear from every successful civilization in history which has invested in the construction and maintenance of water distribution systems. The earliest recognized contribution in fluid mechanics theory was made by Greek mathematician Archimedes. He formulated and applied the buoyancy principle to determine the gold content of the crown of King Hiero. The Romans perhaps the most well-known contributors to early engineering of water distribution systems. They built great aqueducts, bringing water and healthy lifestyle into the biggest cities of the times. Key components to well-designed aqueducts include the use of the correct gradient, not too steep, not too shallow. A good steady gradient of between 1 over 50 and 1 over 1000, depending on the distance the water had to travel, was used to promote constant and laminar flow. The aqueducts crossed valleys on their way to Rome. At certain heights the Romans used the ancient art of arches to raise these structures, but often they used siphons to transport water. Inverted siphons had a header tank on one end of the span and a receiving tank at a lower height. The water would thus siphon through due to the pressure difference. This method was favoured since it kept water clean and safe from potential enemies. The development of water distribution systems was somewhat stifled during the Middle Ages, but began moving forward again during the Renaissance period. In the 13th century, a 5.5 km lead pipeline was installed in the United Kingdom to convey water into London. By the mid 1700s, London had more than 50 km of water mains that had been constructed out of a mixture of wood, cast iron and lead pipelines. During the 1800s, cast iron pipe gradually replaced wooden pipe. In the early 1700s, Henry de Pitot showed that the velocity of a fluid is proportional to the square root of the head. Investigators realised that it took energy to move fluids, but Antoine Chazy was the first to extend this idea to show that head loss in a fluid is proportional to the velocity squared. All subsequent head loss equations in turbulent flow are related to his work. By 1840, an analytical equation for predicting head loss in laminar flow was developed. This work and Chessy's equation were extended to a more general formula by Julius Weisbach and Henry Darcy in 1845. Osborne Reynolds, in 1883, investigated the different flow regimes and was able to clearly define the difference between laminar and turbulent flow. He also identified the dimensionless number, which is used to characterise the different types of flow. Although the dicey weisbach equation could be used to determine head loss in pipes, determining the friction factor proved difficult. Ludwig Prandtl and his associates von Kármán Nicrodazzi, Blasius and Stanton determined that it was the nature of the boundary layer between the fluid and solid phases that determines the drag, also known as the head loss. Nicrodazzi developed the famous experiments in which uniform sand grains were glued to the inside of pipes and head loss was then measured for various velocities. 
These relationships were later summarized in diagrams by Stanton, Hunter Rouse, and later Lewis Moody, showing the relationship between Reynolds number, pipe roughness, and friction factor, which famously became known as the Moody chart. Now let's turn our attention to a West Australian context. In the late 19th century, Perth was a small colony situated on the Swan River. Its water supply was essentially taken care of. However, as gold mining exploded in Coolgardie, limited water supply in Western Australia's hot interior threatened to separate the gold fields from the Perth colony. Premier John Forrest employed Irish-born Australian C.Y. O'Connor to manage and implement a plan that would engineer W.A.'s baptism of fire and lead eventually to Federation. I went to Mundaring Weir in the Helena Valley east of Perth to see where C.Y. O'Connor's dream of the Coolgardie pipeline truly began. O'Connor devised the ingenious yet controversial scheme to transport water from a dam outside of Perth in the Darling Ranges to almost 560 kilometres eastwards to the desert goldfields and Coolgardie. The water scheme comprised of eight pipelines joined together by a series of adjoining pumping stations to push the water uphill all the way to the goldfields. His grand design was ambitious and expensive and led to a deluge of criticism from those who opposed the design and the government. At that time, no other water pipeline of this scale had ever been built before. Here at Mundaring, we are at pump station number one. The water is initially pumped up over the ranges. Losing pressure, a second pump station is needed. Third and a fourth, covering the river, covering the distance across between the ranges and Coolgardie. Finally, Gilgad, pump station number seven, pumps water over to Coolgardie, where it fills the reservoir at Mount Charlotte. We're now in the Helena Valley, in the basin beneath Mundaring Weir. The dam itself has been extended in height within the last century, but this is where it all began. Now let's turn our attention to pumping station number one and how it worked. Notice the very tall tower on pump station number one. This is the exhaust for the furnaces that burn inside that heat the water. The height of the tower creates a greater pressure difference and sucks in more oxygen per unit time, which leads to a greater reaction temperature and hence greater energy being imparted upon the water and a greater heat and greater steam generated. Furnaces drove steam into three steam-powered engines within the pumping station, which were of a revolutionary design for their time. They had two high-pressure cylinders each of 40 centimetres diameter, two intermediate pressure cylinders of 64 centimetres diameter, and then two low-pressure cylinders of 117 centimetres diameter, which had a vacuum pump on the other side of the piston, in order to generate a maximum capacity of 12.7 thousand cubic meters of water a day. The revolutionary pumping system employed by O'Connor was just one of the calculated risks he took during the project. He also used a new locking bar pipe system. He used thinner steel which caused less friction and resulted in fewer leaks than existing riveted steel pipes. These risks combined with the perceived overall foolhardiness of the project put enormous stress on O'Connor, who on the 10th of March in 1902 took his own life, shooting himself on a beach south of Fremantle. O'Connor's project, commissioned in 1896, was completed one year after his death in 1903. It leaves an inspiring legacy in Western Australia's history. Solving for flows and pressures in water distribution systems involves solving thousands of simultaneous nonlinear equations. 
Therefore, design of more efficient systems has increased in parallel with computer power and relevant modelling systems. Nevertheless, engineers throughout the early 20th century were able to design and analyse the hydraulics of functioning systems using a combination of simplifications and conservatism. Freeman developed a graphical method for solving problems with parallel pipes in the late 1800s. Hardy Cross developed a systematic tabular process for calculating system hydraulics but involved extensive use of a slide rule. Digital computers were first used to solve network problems in the early 1950s. Early hydraulic analysis methods were based on computerizing the Hardy Cross method, whereas later methods took advantage of the computer's ability to solve matrix problems. These models were later extended to handle more complex hydraulics and included pumps, control valves, as well as extended period analysis. Water quality modelling was introduced in the 1980s. Recent advances in hydraulic analysis have focused on the integration of modelling as well as geospatial data sources. This has made it less difficult for modellers to create extremely precise, detailed models with a minimum manual labour. Until recently, reading water meters has been a tedious task for utilities. Improvements in automated reading technology are making it much more cost effective. Water distribution system mapping has evolved from pen and paper to digital drawings on computer assisted design and geospatial information systems. Use of these systems enables utilities to combine the functionality of mapping and database systems. Furthermore, the growth of the internet has made the sharing of water distribution system information much easier between utilities, as well as suppliers and regulators. It appears inevitable that as we move forward into the future, as populations around the world grow and climate changes, that the management of water distribution systems is only going to become more important. Future trends for water distribution systems, as identified within the literature, include a better understanding of water quality transformations in pipes, a greater emphasis on energy efficiency as energy prices continue to rise, incorporation of water security considerations into all design and operating decisions, asset management will become more widely incorporated into decision making. This is going to require better sharing information. There will be a wider use of automated meter reading and there will be a greater emphasis on rehabilitation and maintenance of existing water distribution infrastructure as opposed to new construction. Thank you for listening to my presentation on water distribution systems. Remember that we can all have an effect into the future by being water wise. Thank you and goodbye.